Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about physical evidence. Now this chapter really builds on the last chapter, the crime scene. You still have to understand everything that uh, Dr. Saperstein, or the author of the textbook, really talked about in the last chapter. You still want to know about the control. Why do we have the control? Okay, we want to collect that for comparison. He also talks about now what's the difference between identification and comparison. So you want to know those two definitions. And he starts off talking about uh, direct evidence, which is verbal or eyewitness, which can help build a very strong case. But ultimately, you want circumstantial evidence or physical evidence, all right, evidence that um, there's no questioning, really. If you have a good criminalist and good forensic scientist, they're really going to make a strong case using their physical evidence. And physical evidence is a number of things that we're going to get into. Uh, so it can be used for comparison, but more than likely you want to identify what it is that you're looking at or that you collected, exactly where it came from and uh, what it is. Because ultimately it helps to reconstruct your crime scene. Throughout the chapter, it talks about reconstructing the crime scene. You're going to need your everyone, all hands on deck. You need your uh, coroner, your medical examiner, you need all the police officers, you need um, your detectives, your forensic scientists, everyone that's going to be part of collecting the evidence and analyzing the evidence. You need all everyone to really work together, all these practitioners to use their expertise so that you can reconstruct your crime scene and make a strong case so that when you go to court, all right, you get the outcome that you want or that uh, ultimately should come from it. All right. So there are some drawbacks from eyewitnesses. You do want to use eyewitnesses, um, uh, a verbal um, testimony is going to be very useful to explain what happened that day. But there are many drawbacks because people are forgetful. You do need them to sit and, and stand uh at uh, stand trial ultimately so the, if they're forgetful or they had poor eyesight or they don't really remember what happened or they have some background where they don't like the person involved okay then the defense can use that against you so as much as it is good to have eyewitnesses and and have that that evidence that verbal evidence it's even better to have your physical evidence because there's no personal bias um if you remember, if you know anything about the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, there was a detective, and they ultimately uh, made him out to seem like a big racist, and then the jury really sided with O.J. Simpson because they didn't believe um, everything that Mark Furman said, or the you know the way that he went about about uh, collecting evidence and uh, solving the crime, or investigating the crime, I should say. So they're also impeachable, okay? They might have inconsistent testimony where you're going to have to throw out their testimony. The judge is going to dismiss them. Um, so evidence collectors and detectives, they're trained in proper evidence collection and techniques, but you can't take everything with you. So it's really up to the detectives or the collectors to really have intuition on what they should take, what they should take pictures of, what's going to go with them, what's going to stay, what's important, what's not important. So as much as they all might be trained, there are some detectives or collectors that are better at this than others. And this ultimately has a great effect on the case. Uh, remember back to Locard's principle, uh, as much as people like to think that there's a perfect crime where you can get rid of all, uh, all evidence, um, there's always molecules or substances that go to the crime scene and are taken away from the crime scene and that's what Locard's principle is all about it's that forensic scientists it, as the science gets better and better and the technology gets better and better uh, it, this Locard's principle really shines through and shows us that there's always these molecules or these substances that are taken away from the crime scene and can link you link the crime scene to the perpetrator the perpetrator to the crime scene um, <clears throat> Some types of physical evidence, I'll run through them real quick. Blood, semen, saliva, these are important because you can get uh, DNA from them. 
And ultimately, DNA is the big breakthrough that we've had in recent decades. So um, when we talk about class evidence uh, and uh, individual evidence, DNA is the best individual evidence because without a doubt, we know that this DNA, if it matches another person's DNA, that's the same DNA that came from the same person. Okay, the chances of there being someone else with the exact same DNA are so slim that we can consider it impossible. Uh, documents are also physical evidence. We, we can look at the handwriting or the type, where was it printed out. Um, maybe if there's erasures, you're going to look at, at that as well. So documents are also evidence. Uh, drugs. If there's any drugs found at the scene, whether it's legal drugs or illegal drugs, you're going to collect them and try to identify exactly what they are. Students often think that when we talk about collecting drugs that we're talking about uh, marijuana or cocaine or heroin. right? But also, you know, if you find uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol, you find Vicodin, Percocet, Valium, anything that's also maybe legal. Um, NyQuil, whatever it may be, if it's at the scene and it seems to be part of the crime scene, which the investigators will decide, then you're going to want to collect that and make sure that it was not tampered with in any way. All right, there was uh, a case a uh, couple, probably 20 years ago that uh, people were getting drugged. They, when they were taking, I believe it was Tylenol, they uh, were having adverse effects and people thought that it was Tylenol and Tylenol had all these recalls and it was actually someone was going in to uh, pharmacies or grocery stores and they were tampering with them. So investigators had to collect this evidence and see what was it that was actually doing it. They had to identify what was causing these adverse effects, effects because it wasn't the acetaminophen or the Tylenol itself. It was whatever that person was putting in there to do this to those people. So they had to investigate um, on many levels at the plant where the Tylenol was made, at the drug stores where uh, people were buying this from, and uh, also at the people's house houses. Uh, explosives, firearms, ammunition, fibers. When we talk about fibers, it can be natural fibers, meaning hair of any kind, animal fibers, uh, uh, human hair, and also synthetic fibers. Fingerprints. Fingerprints are also excellent individual evidence um, because if you find a certain fingerprint, very slim chance that someone else has the exact same fingerprint. All right, so slim that we don't consider it possible. Glass. Uh, we want to take pieces of glass. We talk about the jigsaw fit. Okay, if something fits perfectly into another piece of broken glass or plastic, uh, then we know that it came from that exact source because it's near impossible that two things are going to break exactly the same. All right, if they break in a in a certain way that um, you could that you could really see it happening again, then you don't use that. But most of the time, if it shatters into a uh, thousand pieces and you're able to piece them back together well then you know that now that's individual evidence that glass or that plastic that broke is individual evidence impressions tire marks shoe marks bite marks uh and food these are all very good depending uh there's a lot of class evidence to impressions but ultimately there are in, there's a lot of individual evidence when you look at shoe prints the way that they're worn now if there's brand new shoes then we can't really get too much individual evidence from them. But if they're worn shoes, no two people are going to wear the shoes out the same way. And tire marks are the same. No, no two sets of tires are going to be driven on exactly the same way. Uh, so we're going to look at the wear marks on both. And then, obviously, uh, fluids. We want to be able to test uh, body fluids, uh, physiological fluids, gastric juices, for example, of any drugs or alcohol. Um, <clears throat> paints when we look at paint chips right this is important because there if you just find one little one single chip all right that's going to be our class evidence okay that'll give us enough evidence to say all right this came from a ford all right. We might even be able to say this came from a Ford between 1998 and 2001. OK, 
Okay, it might even give us enough evidence to say, you know what, this Ford came from this specific plant. But it's not going to give us any individual evidence. Now, if we have a multi-layer chip. that has uh, different layers to it, we can, then it, it gives us more evidence and it can ultimately become individual evidence. Okay, the outside layer is gonna show us some weathering and give us more individual evidence that says, hey, you know, this car came from an area that, uh, was very humid or was very had very harsh winters and that's going to be different than say another ford with the similar paint okay so multi-layer chips going to give us individual evidence one one chip uh one layer of or one chi one layer chip is not going to give us uh any individual evidence of more class evidence so you want that multi-layer chip because that's going to be able to uh give us the evidence that we need to to possibly uh, find someone guilty. Uh, petroleum products and grease, oil stains, we're going to want to find out what they are, where they came from. Plastic bags, think about if someone's, wrapped, if someone's body is wrapped in garbage bags, well, you're going to want to know um, if you find that same garbage bag at their house, well, then that's a piece of of evidence that you can use to build your case. It's all about corroboration, right? All right, and they talk about this in the book, corroboration of evidence, using every piece of evidence together to build your case. One piece of class evidence may not be helpful, okay, but if you have all these pieces of class evidence, Okay, maybe throw in some individual evidence, then that's corroboration of evidence, and that's really going to build your case and help you find this person guilty. All right, plastic, rubber, rubber, other polymers, we now have technology that can tell us exactly what kind of plastic that is, what kind of rubber that is, what kind of polymer that is, and then we can maybe find the source where it came from. Powder residues, gunpowder, other gun residues, primers, etc., typically what you think of. Uh, serial numbers, legible ones, we're going to take photos of them. Uh, if they're not legible, we are still going to possibly use them because newer technology actually helps us to identify what serial number was there once upon a time. Also, many times on, on guns, for example, um, there are other serial numbers in places that maybe criminals didn't know they were there. Also, in cars, there's VIN numbers all over the place on the engine block, on outside of the car the inside of the car so many times people or criminals might think that they got all the serial numbers but we uh, it's our job to find uh, all the serial numbers and take pictures and take notes of what those numbers are also soil and minerals might not mean a lot to me or to you but it could be meaningful to a geologist and really uh, we could use that geologist to tell us well is this found in a specific area and what area is that and where did it come from where uh, what how does it tie into the crime scene tool marks are important um and when we talk about tools it's not just knives or or um axes or anything like that it could be a hammer it could be a screwdriver any type of tool that is used okay we're humans we evolved to use tools and we use many different types of tools to commit crimes it's not always just a, a tool used for to hurt someone but it could be a tool used to break in somewhere or something else uh, vehicle lights once again this goes back to the jigsaw fit okay also uh, it may help reconstructing the crime scene what people saw what people didn't see there there's actually a way for them to see uh, when there was a car accident, if the lights were on or not. If the lights were on, well, then that tells you that that crash happened at night. If the lights were off, it probably happened during the day. And this can help uh, see if uh, the stories that they're getting, the witnesses, the stories that they're getting from witnesses or, or from suspects really all line up. And also wood and vegetative matter, also uh, good to use if you find you know, a leaf that's only found in a certain force. Well, you know that they went there, they came from there, something of that nature. So all of this is good physical evidence. What it's up to, uh, what we were ultimately looking for is that 
the detective or the evidence collector is able to pinpoint this and take this with them. So once again, physical evidence is usually collected for identification and or comparison. And in this chapter, you want to know the difference. Okay, They are not one and the same. Identification is actually identifying that substance okay, with a near absolute certainty. Okay, Comparison is finding something so that we can make connections or, or really, I mean, ultimately compare two different things. So you might be able to compare two different things without identification. Okay. So identification of evidence is important. Later you can use it to compare, but comparison is a major part of crime scene investigation and convicting a suspect. This is a major, major overarching theme in this textbook. Uh, in this chapter, individual evidence versus class evidence. So individual evidence are individual char characteristics, evidence that can be associated with a common source with an extremely high degree of prob probability. We see this over and over again, high degree of probability. You want to know what that means. Okay, Fingerprints, bullet markings, knife markings, broken objects, DNA, jigsaw fit, they're all individual evidence. We have class evidence, evidence that can be associated with a group, okay? And often dis, uh, people are disappointed or investigators are disappointed as they find out that the limitations that the lab has because of their inability to uh, relate evidence to a specific origin with a high degree of certainty. So while we have the high degree of certainty for individual evidence, we don't have it for class evidence. And what you ultimately want to understand is that uh, class evidence is still good because it puts uh, evidence into this group, like we talked about. It's still scientific data that is objective. It's not subjective. It's there. It happened. It's real. We have it. Okay, so that's useful. And also, we can use it to exonerate a, an innocent suspect. All right, so those are three things that really show that they're helpful. All right, so don't think class evidence is, is useless. It is rather useful. So some advantages, all right, provides corroboration of events based on objective scientific data. Often the chances or odds of encountering two indistinguishable, indistinguishable items of class physical evidence, which actually originated from different sources, are slight. Uh, when dealing with more than one type of class evidence, their collective presence, right, we talked about collective presence, all right, may lead to an extremely high certainty that they originated from the same source. Okay, physical evidence, whether it be an individual or class, is, is accorded great weight in the courtroom, and class evidence may also serve to exonerate a person from a crime. So the product rule, that's what we talk about, where we're combining all these pieces of class evidence to ultimately uh, show that we can prove it was this suspect uh, to a high degree of certainty. High degree of certainty. You want to know that that's what probability is all about. All right. When we're using probability in forensic science in the courtroom, we want a high degree of certainty uh, that the probability uh, of them doing it is there. So DNA is very important in cases. It really changed forensic scientists, science because it uh, there's a high probability that it is the only sample that there is in the world. That's the only person that has that DNA. So an example of a product rule, uh, O.J. Simpson, he had type A blood, which 26% of people had, have. All right, so that doesn't say, oh, he's the only guy that has that blood. Um, then he has this ESD1 blood factor within his blood. 85% of people had that, so that didn't really help too much. But then he had this PGM2 positive, 2 negative blood factor. And that between this one and this one, that really narrowed it down. And that really painted a picture for the jury, all right, even though he was found not guilty. It really helped paint a picture to the, to the jury, all right, that there's a, only one in 227 people have this, all right? So it's rather likely that this blood came from him, opposed to uh, if we talked about just this one where, well, 85% of people have that, that's, that doesn't really help us, okay? That's more than 8 out of 10 people have that blood factor. That doesn't help. 
the weaknesses in forensic science, science, although people think that it is not very weak, all right, we do find some weaknesses. Inability to assign an exact or even approximate probability of occurrences for class evidence. So forensic science, uh, as, as, as good as it is, as far as we've come, all right, statisticians have not been able to really pinpoint the probability of every little thing. And it has become harder as more things are mass produced, okay? Um, if they make 50,000 Ford F-150s each year, well, then pinpointing that it was a Ford F-150 is not really going to help anybody at any time. Uh, we do not possess the data to calculate probability of specific occurrence of each piece of class evidence. Blood factors are an exception because we have the data for this information. Okay, so some things we do have the data for. We do know how many pe people or what percentage of people are type A, what percentage are... O negative, O positive, but um, we don't know uh, how many uh, red Ford Broncos are still around from uh, from 1997 that uh, have over 200,000 miles on them. Practitioners tend to try to uh, only collect physical evidence with significant amount of diversity, but often this cannot be immediately determined, so they're going to collect the evidence anyway. Okay, Anything that you might think is pertinent or important, you're going to collect that, and you're going to uh, decide later on if it is important or if it is not important. A lot of times, if, you, if a detective has been doing it a long time, they'll have a better idea of what's going to be useful and what's not going to be useful. Uh, they're going to try to use multiple pieces or types of evidence to show a collective. All right. So you want to, once again, go back to the product rule. All right. An example of that, uh, Wayne Williams murders in Atlanta, Georgia. This guy went around uh, killing people, and they were able to use these different fibers to prove that he was guilty of numerous murders. If they only had one fiber from this guy and from the scene, they wouldn't have been able to do anything. But they had 28 different fibers that matched. So ultimately they said, oh, had to be Wayne Williams. And they connected him to a number of murders. As technology becomes more sophisticated, practitioners have to become more specialized to analyze evidence and be expert witnesses. So when you watch a movie like My Cousin Vinny and they call in an FBI expert in shoe marks, tire tracks, uh, tool marks, whatever it may be, now we're seeing that people are going are becoming more specialized. There's a guy just for tool marks. There's a guy just for for shoe prints. There's a guy just for tire tracks. So the jury ultimately plays a major role in deciding if the evidence is substantial. So as much as we'll call in these expert witnesses and we'll have these new ways of analyzing uh, evidence and looking at the data and statisticians that are trying to find out the probability, what, what ultimately has to happen is you have to show to the jury that this person is guilty without a doubt. And that's what ultimately is hard. And that's what happened with the O.J. Simpson trial is that they weren't able to say, yes, this 100 percent was uh, O.J. Simpson. So crime scene reconstruction. All right. The textbook goes over this over and over again. In order to reconstruct your crime scene, you need to have every everyone helping out your medical examiner, coroner, criminalist, uh, your detectives. Everyone should be all hands on deck for this to reconstruct, and you need as much evidence as possible, as much eyewitnesses. You need everything to bring it all together. Uh, so preserving impressions, you're going to take uh, photographs or lift impressions, all right, and you're going to make a cast of impressions. Okay, these two are the biggest things. You want photographs, and you want to make a cast. You're going to want to know the hierarchy of evidence. Okay, DNA, most important. Okay, fingerprints, very important as well, because this is individual. Jigsaw fit, individual. And then we get to hair fibers and so on. This is class evidence. And everything after this is going to be class evidence. Still important, but not as important as these three. Okay, DNA, fingerprints, jigsaw fit, they are our individual evidence. Hair fibers, 
They might be helpful if it still has the root. Okay, that root has has uh, cells from the scalp, and we can use that for DNA evidence. But many times, there's just it's just the hair fibers, and that's our class evidence. Blood typing is very important as well because we have the statistics for that, the probability of that, and it helps us uh, exonerate any uh, innocent suspects. We talked about this in class. Uh, positive and negative blood types are based on the Rh factor, another an antigen, while the the AB antigen is what ultimately makes you an A, a B, a AB, or an O. Whether you're you ha have a, if you have the antigen A antigen, then you're A. If you have the Rh factor, then you're A positive. If you have the B antigen and you don't have the Rh factor, you'd be B negative. If you don't have any you would be o, o negative, and so on and so forth. And this just shows us how that we find this out, right? We're going to put anti-A on, and it's going to have a reaction, okay? And we also put our RH factor solution on. And if it reacts, we know that it has those RH antigens. So ultimately, if it's reacting with A and it's reacting with the RH factor, we know it's A positive, and so on. Impression evidence. <clears throat> uh, what's most important here when we talk about impressions, tool marks, uh, shoe prints, tire tracks is really preservation. Of the evidence. That's what's most important. All right, preservation. So as a detective, as a practitioner, you want to preserve whatever evidence you have. Okay, you wanna make that cast before someone messes with that tire track. So impression evidence can be defined as objects or materials that have retained the characteristics of other objects throughout, through direct contact. So they're created when one object is pressed against another material with enough force to leave an impression on the object, right? Depending on what that object is, it might take more force than another object. Shoe prints, uh, tool marks, tire tracks, bite marks, uh, bullet marks, uh, they're all examples of impression uh, evidence. And uh, impressions may be found in or on many different types of materials. Um, we're going to use this casting to get a 3D look at it. And we're going to use photography so we have a 2D representation of it. When we're taking photographs of tire marks, shoe prints, you're going to want to do it at an angle. All right, somewhere between 20 degrees and 50 degrees, All right? So you get that side angle. Uh, if you take a, a picture of a shoe print in the snow at from 90 degrees directly overhead, well, you're not really gonna see the marks very well. So you take it from an angle and you get a better picture of what that print looks like, what that shoe print looked like or what that tire mark looked like. Uh, tire tracks are important in forensic investigations and are usually found in road uh, accident scenes or in the uh, access and escape routes of other crime scenes. Investigators may make ink prints of a tire or plaster casts. Right, we talk about plaster casts, very important because then you can go back and really examine uh, the, the evidence without having to worry about, well, if it rains, it's going to ruin this print in this mud and so on and so forth. Some uh, features to analyze are tread patterns, width and depth of the tread pattern, uh, unique characteristics, the way that uh, they were worn, just like with shoe prints, uh, you want to find any defects or patterns. Tool marks can be classified in two ways. They're either impressions or scratches. Uh, we're going to look at the striations. 
You always want to look at the striations. So whether it is a hammer or it's a knife, there's going to be little striations that are only found on that specific tool. All right, not all hammers have have a little divot or a ridge or a striation exactly in the same spot that another hammer does because they were all used differently and had uh, different life, lives to them ultimately. So we're either going to use a casting method or a casting solution to get them. And then there's another one called Wood's Metal. They don't really use Wood's Metal anymore because you have to heat it up in order to make the, the metal a liquid and to uh, have it sink into that mark. And then you have to worry about is heating that that metal and putting it into that mark going to damage the mark. You don't ever want to uh, stick a tool into that mark to see if it fits because you're going to damage that mark. You don't want to uh, be too rough with the casting or the wood's metal and then ruin that that as well. Now wood's metal, you want to know that it is actually an alloy. If you know anything about alloys, it's like a mixture. So it has bismuth, lead, tin, and cadmium. Uh, cadmium all in it and that's what that woods metals is made out of so you can heat it up it's not impossible to heat it up we heat it up put it into that impression and that's how we get our our ultimately our metal cast out of a tool mark uh, we're looking at dimensions of the impression ridges or striations divots uh, defects such as nicks or chips in that knife or that hammer or that screwdriver paint chips or metal shards left on a tool shoe prints we talked about this extensively uh they're going to analyze uh them for the class evidence what size were they what brand were they what type of shoe were they were they a sneaker or a boot and then individual characteristics such as the wear patterns and the defects or the damages once again the, the divots or the holes in them and the fbi actually has a database and can really pinpoint uh, what type of shoe it was and, and maybe hopefully if there not very many were made they can uh, see where it was purchased and depending on the quality of the impression investigators may be able to determine the person's speed were they walking or running as well as the evident uh, estimate the size of a person based on the impressions uh, the depth of the impression were they very heavy were they uh, very skinny and then you want to determine were they uh, walking or running and the size of a person based on its impression of death, the depth of their impression, tread pattern size, depth, wear pattern, so on and so forth. Bite marks, uh, you can analyze uh, for characteristics. I know two people are going to have exactly the same teeth unless you had veneers or something like that, but or dentures. But that's also individual evidence if you can get a perfect uh, bite mark. Now, a lot of times if, if you're getting it from a piece of food or something, you're not going to get a perfect bite mark. All right? But a piece can help add to your case. And ultimately, what well, you might want to really be pulling off of the uh, that evidence that you found with bite marking is maybe saliva or blood. So then you do have your DNA evidence. So you're going to analyze the type of bite mark is a human or animal characteristics of the teeth uh, you can go back to dent dental records and identify who that person was uh, color of area to estimate how long ago the bite occurred is it old or is it a recent bite and once again swab for body fluids because you're praying that you can get dna evidence some final notes uh, blood splatter uh, can indicate the distance of the source the direction of travel nature of force used sequencing of bloodshed events, tra transfer patterns, and even uh, object used to cause the injury. There's different types of uh, impact spatter that we talk about. Low velocity, so you're going to end up with these circular shaped drops. And that's when something just dro drops from a 90 degree angle. And it's always going to be circular like this. Sometimes it might be bumpy, depending on where it lands, if it's a bumpy surface, but it's going to remain circular if it's just from gravity. Okay, if someone's standing there, they have an open wound, it's just dropping on the floor, it's going to look like this. 
if you have uh, a little bit, someone is running, okay, or if someone was stabbed, you're going to see that there's an angle less than 90 degrees, maybe 50 degree angle, and it's going to look like this. Okay, you're going to have these spatters that are going to be at an angle. They're no longer circular, they're more oval shaped. Okay, and the speed or force is greater than that of just normal gravity. And then you have high velocity impact spatter where you're going to have little little dots all right and that's typically from gunshots or explosions okay if you see that in one part you have these little dots and then somewhere else you go and you have these circular spots of blood you're going to know that well okay maybe they were shot here and then they went to sit down somewhere and they started dripping blood and that was just from your your low velocity or your gravity impact spatter okay these are these high velocity ones are typically less than two millimeters, very small in diameter. Okay, and they happen because it's a speed or force greater than 100 feet per second. So that's only going to happen with gunshots or explosions. Otherwise, if you see those ovals, all right, you know that that's medium velocity. All right, and just some final notes. You want to know that in this chapter, over and over again, they talk about the difference of uh, identification versus comparison. You want to know about class evidence versus individual evidence. Okay. Um, and corroboration of evidence, degree of probability. All these terms should be familiar. You should know what they mean, what they're talking about, what they're referring to. That's all for Biology Minds. Have a good day.